can spend a minute reviewing that. And then we can go on to bigger and better things. Well, I won't say better things, and I won't say bigger things either. We'll go on to different things. Okay, here is our Groundhog's Day page. And when we bring it up, this is what we see. All right. Now, let's review the tags. To repeat what I've said a number of times, change from text documents to all files, and then you can open it up. The other thing I want to do is I want to be sure that when I go into the folder, I click Organize, Folder and Search Options, and I change the view to Not Hide Extensions for Known File Types. That way we can see the complete name, because the complete name is important as we are looking at that. We need to know the exact, precise, complete name of the file, of the image file, in order to reference it. And again, the name of all files is the file name plus what's called a file extension. So if we're going to create a link, we have to do .html, .gif, or .jpg if we're going to use those as images. So, in looking at this example, I have the image tag. I should have two image tags. And associated with an image tag, there is a source attribute and there is a alt attribute. Every image should have both of those attributes. What are those attributes? What do they represent? They represent specifically what image do you want to show, right? On any given website, there can be a whole bunch of different images. Well, which one do you want to appear in this position on this page? You have to give the name of the image, all right? The all attribute is to provide for people that are accessing your page via a screen reader. That is, people uh, who are visually impaired. It gives them a little description of the image just to let them know what it is that is there, all right? So in this case, groundhogday.jpg, amos underscore groundhog-940x626.gif. We talked a little bit about editing pictures. Uh, you're not expected in this class to be an expert at editing pictures, but you should know some basic rules about editing pictures, and you should be familiar with a simple editor, such as Microsoft Paint, all right? Some of you that maybe take digital pictures, maybe you have your own editor that you can go and, and do things with and, and change the image. But you should at least be able to resize an image. thing to remember about resizing an image is that you can make an image smaller, but you can't make an image bigger without damaging the quality of it. When you make a, an image smaller, it can take the stuff that's there and make a smaller version of it. But when you take a small image and try to make it bigger, it's trying to fill in data that just isn't there. And as a result, the picture is going to end up blurry. 
Uh, edges which appear like lines in the original picture are going to appear like jagged staircases and, st and so on. For that reason, always keep an original of the image that you're using. Because that way, if you decide you want to make it bigger, you can go to the original as opposed to trying to expand the smaller one. All right. Any questions on this? One thing that you should not do is, is what's called hot linking an image. Does anyone know what hot linking an image is? Yes. Putting the complete URL there. Let me give you a, a for instance. Well, I'll do it with actually this image. In other words, I could do this. I could put the address that that image is on the web for the SRC. And I can put HTTP colon blah 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 blah, the full address of it I can put there. And then when I go and refresh the page, oh there it is, of course it's the original size, but that image is there. What's wrong about doing that? There's a couple things wrong about doing that. You effectively are stealing their bandwidth. All right? In other words, when you use a hot link like that to an image, you're asking their web server to deliver that image to the browser. Well, some web hosting programs have a limit about what can be downloaded. And you're actually asking the server to download content for your page. You're asking their web server to download content. So effectively, you're stealing a bit of their bandwidth. The other thing that's possible is, and this has been done in the past, is, is people um, could replace that image with a different image. Maybe an image that you would not want your customers to see. All right? Something um, that, that wasn't pleasant to see. All right? They actually did that, um, a political campaign, actually, years ago. Um, hot link to an image on a site, and the person found out about it was angry and replaced it with another image. So people visiting the politician's page saw uh, an image that uh, was not a pleasant image to see. So you don't want to do that. Again, in the case of an educational class such as this, in an academic class such as this, you are allowed to download and use images that you find on the internet as long as you give them credit, all right? Um, if you're doing a website just as a regular person, or if you're doing it for a nonprofit organization, or for a business, or even just as a hobby, you would require the permission of whoever holds the copyright for that, all right? And again, if you take the picture, you own the copyright of it. Um, you can also look for what are called Creative Commons licensed pictures. And those are pictures where the person that owns the copyright sort of gives a blanket permission that says you can go ahead and use that. All right. Okay. So, let's try to make our page a little more interesting by, that's an impressive image. All right. I like this guy. So, I'm going to go, I'm going to save the image on the desktop. And I want to make the image the background for the entire page. So I'm going to get rid of the image. I want the page to have a background of that groundhog. So I'm going to copy my smaller image with and replace it with a bigger image. And just for simplicity's sake, instead of giving it this big long name, I'm going to change the name of it to just amos.gif. So let me go in here and edit. Now, is this a change I'm going to make to the HTML or the CSS? Well, it's a change to the appearance of the page. It's a background image. And therefore, I'm going to make the change to the CSS. The way you can do that is by saying background, instead of specifying a color, 
you can put URL and then in parentheses put the name of the picture. Like that. Now, notice again, all my images and files are in one folder. I get this question a lot um, from students, like how do I turn in my assignment when I have more than one file? The way you do it is keep everything in one folder, at least for now. Later on, we'll talk about what if you want to put things in different folders. Because again, if you get on a big project, you're liable to have a lot of different images, a lot of different web pages and other files. So you want to organize them just like you would organize the files on your computer. All right? But for now, we can put everything in the same folder. So, then when you want to refer to the file, all you need to do is give the name of the file, like amos.gif. Groundhog Day dot JPEG. And they're all within the same folder. Now when we look at this, you'll notice that we get an error. We don't get an error, we don't see the background image. There we go. And there's the groundhog as the background image to our whole page. Now, notice what when you do this, some of the text becomes a little hard to read. All right? So one thing to be aware of is you're, if you're doing an image like this is to make sure that the text appears on that. And you can do that a couple different ways. First of all, if you pick a plainer sort of image, a, an image that doesn't have a lot of different colors, um, you can ensure that. Let's go, for example, and look for a, a picture of the desert. Again, I don't know what a desert has anything to do with Groundhog's Day, but... I think I'm on dial-up internet here, so it takes a while for these things to load. Let's try this one. All right, so I'm going to go and save this image. the original on the desktop. Now if you notice, the original image of this is 17.2 megabytes. That's a pretty good sized image. We wouldn't necessarily want to use the full blown image because the full blown image is like 3,000 pixels wide. So I'm going to resize this image to make it smaller. So how do I resize it? I can go into Microsoft Paint. And I can go to resize it. And I could make it maybe um, a thousand pixels. We'll do 1280 pixels wide. 
and then I'll go and save this as BG for background. Then I can copy that over into my folder. And I can give bg.png. Again, I have to know the exact name of the image. This is neither a GIF or a JPEG, it's a PNG file. Those are the three image types that you can use. GIFs, JPEGs, and PNGs. All right, so now I save this, and if I look at the page, now it looks a little bit better. Some of the colors still don't show up right, but I could play with the colors and get it to work the way that I wanted to. All right, the other thing I can do is I can play with the contrast and brightness of the picture to almost give it like a watermark effect. All right, yeah, especially if I have a more sophisticated uh, image editor. Um, I don't know if I can do that with just paint. But let me look at another, see if we have any other image editors. We'll try this one. Oh, I see this isn't cooperating. Well, what you can do is you can change the brightness to sort of give it sort of a faded out look. The other thing that's often done is you'll use a background pattern. Now you can see it here, but actually the pattern sort of repeats itself if the image doesn't fill up the whole screen. All right. Now you can control that and you could have it not repeat if you don't want to. But one thing that people often do is they look for Background patterns sometimes are called background tiles. Now what a background, what a tile is, is a simple, small image, like, this looks like a good one. I'm going to go save this picture. Saving it as a bitmap, which we can't use. So I'm going to go save it as a bitmap. Edit it with paint. And then I am going to save it as a JPEG. And I'll call it bg.jpg. Now notice this picture is about this big. It only covers up a portion of the screen. But given that it doesn't fill up the whole screen, it's going to tile it. Just like if you did like tiles on, you know, your bathroom walls or floors or whatever. The tiles are, have sort of an interlocking pattern. So 
it looks like it's one continuous image, but it's actually one small image that's tiled, repeated over and over again, both horizontally and vertically. And again, you can change that if you don't want to. But this, you see, this allows us to see, because it's a light background, it's almost like what we had originally, where we had a light blue, except it's a little bit of pattern, a little bit of texture. Now, I still don't like the fact that when I look at this, um, Oh, I, I know why. I know why that's not showing up right. Let me view this in. Let me view this in Google Chrome. There we go. All right. A couple things that are wrong. This white isn't showing up very good, so I can go and make that another color. But the rest of it does show up right. Now notice that this looks slightly different between Google Chrome and if we were to open this up in Microsoft Internet Explorer. Namely, in Google Chrome, meaning is a light blue, whereas in Internet Explorer, meaning is in black. All right. At this point, I just want you to notice that. All right. Web pages can look different between different browsers for a number of reasons. In this particular case, we have an old version of Internet Explorer on this machine, one that doesn't support all the features of HTML5. So it doesn't really know what to do with the tags from HTML5. So it kind of ignores them. All right. Now we'll talk about later on in the course how to address that. But at the very least, notice what I did is I made it so that the page appears readable in both platforms, both in Internet Explorer and Chrome. It's not identical because of the bug in, or the issue rather, in Internet Explorer. But, the, but at the very least, it's usable both in Internet Explorer and in Google Chrome. That really is one of the biggest challenges of web development. Um, it's less of a challenge than it was several years back, but there's still issues where you have something that works in one browser and something that does not work in another browser. And it's your job as a web developer to make it usable across as many platforms as possible. It's really the mark of an amateur in my book to put a notice on your page that says you have to view this page in such and such browser. The job of a web developer is to make it work at least to some level across all browsers, as, as much of a browser as much as humanly possible. So I put the background on the body, but I could put the background on other things too. So for example, I could put the background on the article. If I wanted to. And then the whole page just has a white background and the areas that the article has sort of the background that matches that. All right. So you can put those on, on really any tag that you want to. I could go and say that I within articles H2s, I want to look that way. And then the background is only on the H2. So you have a lot of flexibility of how to do this. You actually could give background images on everything on your page. 
all right? And that would be a mess, all right? So you have to balance what you think is going to help the user understand your page and help the user mentally separate your page into sections with avoiding overkill, all right? If, for example, I put the background on these H2s, that sort of divides the page up logically into sections, and the user can see that quite easily. If I put a different background image on everything on the page, then the user would be very distracted uh, by that, all right? So, you know, it's like someone that always yells, right? Someone that always yells, you can't tell when they're mad. You can't tell when they're emphasizing something, right? If, on the other hand, you have a very soft-spoken person, and one day they come in yelling about something, you're going to notice it. Right? Because it's different. It stands out. So you want to use things like color and things like background patterns, not just to use them because, gee, that's a cool thing I learned in class, but to use them to emphasize different parts of your page and emphasize, emphasize how the content on your page is organized. All right? Any questions about this? Yes. Well, you can tell your own personal image. In other words, you know, if I had, you know, let's pretend, let's pretend I took that picture. All right. I could go in and say, I could put on the background of the body that picture, all right, and the browser will tile it. So I get the, I get the groundhog repeated over and over and over again. That's what I mean by tiling, is that since, the, bat, since the, the image of the groundhog doesn't fill up the whole browser window, it copies it, and it copies it vertically, and it copies it horizontally. It knows automatically to do that. Now, you can specify otherwise. You can specify it to only tile vertically, only tile horizontally, or not to tile at all. But again, that's, that's something for another day. Um, we can't possibly cover, in the couple of days that we're, we're uh, doing our introduction to CSS, everything that you can do via CSS. But I encourage you to experiment on your own. And the W3 Schools is a great site for that. Because what you can do is they give you a little snippet of code, and you can play around with it. So I'm going to go to Learn CSS. And it will show me something like CSS backgrounds. And it shows me what happens if I have a style and I put a background color of light blue. And what I can do is I can experiment and say, I want a background color of red. And then it makes a change for me. Or maybe I want a background color of red and I want a color of yellow. and then I can see the result. Now, they also have a background image. Try it yourself with paper. All right? I could say no repeat and it messes it up. Oh, background repeat. So I'd have to say background repeat. And there it shows just one of them. Or I could say repeat X and it will repeat horizontally. 
or repeat Y and it will repeat vertically. Now, here's something again we're going to come back to later on, but notice how background image and background repeat both start with the word background. There's a shorthand for referring to this. You can simply say background and then put all the attributes. And that would be the same thing as saying background URL, background repeat. The browser's smart enough to know that if you have a URL, that you mean the background image. And it's smart enough to know if you have the word repeat dot or dash x that you're talking about the repeat property. So this is the equivalent of what we had before. Getting a little ahead of myself, but again, you're well, the, 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 the bigger question is, is that you're willing to go in and, or, or you, you, uh, you should be willing, uh, and it's a good idea to go in and experiment with these things. All right? Pick something that you want to be able to do. Like if you say, gee, I want to change the... I want to change the kind of text it is. I could look under CSS text and they'll show me things like oops. Here's how I could change the font. I could put in there a list of fonts that I wanted. So notice the font is different here. Alright, so by all means experiment. Alright, I'm going to try to make this page look somewhat uh, the semblance of a decent looking page. So let me go in and get rid of some of the background images that I don't need. And I'll get rid of some of the extra stuff. Okay, and there we have that, which, again, not necessarily a perfect web page, but hey, it's, it's a start. All right? Now, I believe next week we're going to start talking about web design, because we've hit the tip of the iceberg, and again, anything that, anytime we talk about web development, we have to remember there's sort of two aspects of it, and we want to develop both aspects equally as strong. There's the technical aspect. In other words, how do I change the color of a page? How do I use CSS to, to change the color of the page? How do I set an image? How do I set a heading? Things like that. Then there's the design aspect of the page. In other words, what can I do visually to make my page easy to read, clearly organized, easy to understand, and so on. So we learn the technical of how to do certain things. And then the design aspect of it is, well, how do I use those things to effectively communicate my message? All right? So one of the key aspects of web design is you want your pages to look consistent. All right? You don't want one page to look like it belongs on one kind of site and another page look uh, like it belongs on a different site. So therefore, consistency is the key. So what we want to do 
in this case is I want to take out the CSS code from this file and put it in its own file. And the reason I want to do that then is I'm going to have both of my, I'm going to create a second web page and I'm going to have all my web pages point to the same CSS code. So if I want to change all the pages on my site, I don't have to go in and change each page individually. I just change the one CSS file. So let's review how to do that. All right, this is a key thing of guaranteeing that the design is consistent. I'm going to close all these windows out for now. I'm going to go and I'm going to copy the CSS code. Notice I'm not copying the style tag. When you put your CSS code in a separate file, there's other ways that the browser knows that it's CSS code other than the style tag. So we're not going to need the style tag here. So I'm going to cut that, get rid of that. I'm going to create new, and I'm going to paste my CSS code. Notice no style tag, just the CSS code. I'm going to go and I'm going to save it. And I'm going to save it in the same folder with my other files, right? Because that's what we do. And I'm going to call it style.css. So just like we clicked all files and saved our web file as gh.html, I'm going to save this file as style.css. And I'm going to put it in the same folder as all my other files. So I click Save. And there it is. I can right mouse on it and say Open with Notepad. And it'll open up in Notepad. And I'm good to go. Now, I'm going to open up my HTML page again. And I took out the style code. I now have to go <coughs> and point this web page to look at my new CSS file. Originally, the CSS code was all part of this one file. So it knew how to find it. Right now, there's no CSS code associated with this page. So if I viewed it, it would just look like a plain, simple page like we did the first week of class. So what I have to do is I have to link it to the CSS. And here's how you do that. Link rel equals style sheet. Type equals text.css. That part's always going to be the same. href, though, is going to be what do you think href's going to be? Style.css, the name that I called my style sheet. So href, just like with links, indicates, hey, this is a file that I want to use that's going to contain my CSS. So I now save this and there we go. All right. Back to where we were before, but notice the code isn't in there. There's a link to another file. Now, the advantage really comes in when, is when we start talking about multiple files. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to save this as ghmovie. Save 
No. Just like the image, you could leave it without an end tag or you could put a slash like that. So I'm going to make the second page talk about the movie Groundhog's Day. I'm just going to make it look a little different just by adding things. Now notice that the original page, shoot, the original page and my new page have the same style associated with them. Why? Because I don't have any style code into them. I link to that external file. So this page and this page look the same. All right. So I get a consistent look. The good thing is, is if I change that CSS file then, both pages will change. So if I were to go in and edit this to say the background color was red. both pages get that change simply by changing the one DSS file. If I change the color to green, both pages change. So in that way, you can keep your pages consistent. All right? And that's a very, very powerful thing. All right? By being able to do that, you can decide a layout for your site, and you can decide how you want your navigation to look like, how do you want your header to look like, how do you want your footer to look like, and all those sorts of things. And you can put all of those style rules in a single file. And then every page will have, will use the same CSS file and therefore will look the same. So you'll have a consistent look of the pages on your site. And again, that's a very desirable goal. You don't want your pages on, the site, on your site to look radically different. Whereas um, one page has a navigation on the left, the other page has a navigation on the top or something like that. You want all your pages to have a consistent look and feel. All right. Now you might decide to change that. You might decide to move the navigation from the left to the top, but you'd want to do that on every single page. And by putting your style in an external file like this, you have the ability for every single page to link to that style file and every single page to look like that. So let me review the steps. You put the style code in a file. 
you omit the style tag. You don't need the style tag when you put it in a separate file. The browser knows other ways that this is CSS code. You'll then save the file and you'll give it a name. And that name usually ends with .css. You then, on each of the pages that are going to use that file, you will go in and create a link. And again, it's not a link like a link to another page. It's a link actually using the link tag that says, hey, this page uses the style sheet. And this is the syntax for it. Link, rel equals style sheet. Type equals text dot slash CSS. And then finally, href equals the name of your style sheet file. All right. Now again, notice what I did. Not what I wanted to do. Everything is in that one folder. The style file, the different images, the different web pages. And so if I was going to turn this in, I could simply right mouse, say, send to compressed folder, and then that would be the file that I would turn in, the zip file. Um, notice again, as I look at these, nowhere in there does it say like C colon user mzeller slash documents or desktop or something like that. It's just the file name, all right? Because I had some people ask, like, how is this going to work when you load it on your machine? Because my image has, like, my home directory in it. Well, you don't put the directory in it. You just put the name of the file name, and just be sure that you give me a folder that contains all of the files, and then I'll be able to access it. Any questions about any of this? What I'd like you to do for next time is to think what makes a good web page. Think of your favorite web pages, pages that you go to a lot, all right? And pages that you think are well designed. And then think of some pages that you think are not so well designed. And what we're going to do is we're going to discuss that and we're going to try to come to some conclusions about what makes a page either well designed or poorly designed. And then we'll focus our efforts to make sure that our pages are well designed. Any questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.